welcome to my channel. This stream today is going to be about texture. I am working with my toolbook, which is a journal that I dedicated to a visual inspiration board. Because uh, I know a lot of people is like, write it down, make lists, but uh, I'm not the lista kind of person. <laughs> so I'm more like a visual person, so I need illustrations to remind me about things because I get pretty, you know, start reading pretty fast if I have to go down lists, so I'm like skipping things like, duh, 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 you know, <laughs> so it's just like it doesn't really stick to my noodle, right? So I'm trying for myself to make this glue book where I'm using pattern paper to make uh, illustration faster, putting in all the tips and tricks that I can think of at current state. We're talking like 2021. 20, <laughs> I have been uh, being creative for about, I would say, three years actually, maybe four. I don't know. The first couple of years don't really count because it was more about shopping and uh, progressing from a stick figure to a full figure, you know, like just goofing around, you know. And actually finding my medium. My medium is watercolor, for sure. Uh, so I'm building this uh, journal, and I'm dividing it up into sections. And the section that I have reached at this moment is about texture. Texture for me is a lot of things. Texture is when you're done with your, the line work of your drawing, what to add to it. And it can be everything from pencil marks to pattern paper to actually use some of the mediums that are out there like stencil paste or you know adding collage pieces and using uh, tools like masking fluids to enhance things and the um, embossing powder <laughs> whatnot uh, I'm not um, fully equipped in my stash with everything that's out there so I just uh, decided to make this journal and uh, give myself the 26 cue cards of watching my stats at the moment and trying to put down the cue cards to remind me about, hey, in my drawers I got these uh, different items that may help me create texture, right? <laughs> So the first page spread that I did in this topic was this one where I was um, playing with a gesso background where I'm adding on magicals and ink tins and then oil pastels and trying to create like an abstract cityscape. The second spread that I did was taking a very famous moss piece from Banksy creating a, a textured wall. And the third piece was trying to look at the texture in a Monet uh, lily pond painting and using modeling paste to carve out a raised uh, corner element so that I kind of made this spread without using any sketch and a brush, you could say. I was making texture with a spatula <laughs> so um yeah the next um flip here is about collage items kathy arbor kathy arbor um got a stream way back in the, the 16th of february 2019 where she titled the stream collage with me and she shows you like step for step how you can collage in an apple and <laughs> it is a uh, such a fun uh, you could call it paint along um it's um very new to me to use uh, mono printed jelly print uh, collage papers that we made ourselves and let that be not only the texture but also um the, the the painting itself i mean the texture from this is just awesome because it's from a jelly print print <laughs> before that stream she had a stream called how to mono print papers and it was done the 15th of february 2019 so the day before where she showcased how to uh, 
do mono prints on the jelly and still get a you know a different kind of pattern and tones transitions into other tones so pretty awesome very uh, informative stream and then I also pasted in this it's a streamer Janet M. Young <laughs> she's the queen of making textured paper with intense magicals watercolor I mean these abstract sheets where she's um, throwing on a lot of colors and then she shows afterwards how you can press out uh, art coins you can use it as a background uh, if you do like negative painting and I mean I'm so inspired by the way she she thinks she's just sitting and goofing around <laughs> with the products testing it out but I really subtract so much from her streams um, she's got this stream right, right here called Rapidio, Rapidiograph pen talk and watercolors and she was streamed it the 18th of February 2019 where there is a tutorial on how she did this flower right but before that she had a stream called magicals on embossed watercolor paper 27th of January 2020 okay that's like the month after but, but I picked this one because first of all she's using embossed watercolor paper which means that you already got some embossed te texture on your substrate to begin with and then she's um, having a stream that's pretty awesome showing six I think different ways of um, using magicals on the on paper so what she does is that she makes this uh, sheet filled with marks and splatters and, and all kind of things so it's an interesting starting point if you're doing negative painting and blocking in your image so for sure I mean I really love this and this is one of those examples where texture is not like a raised element attached to your paper like here it's paper piecing so it's got like raised elements but this is um, texture done with <laughs> art supplies <laughs> <laughs> instead of just painting it in a flower my next spread is going to be right here and it's going to be about a hot butt for me to crack I mean outdoor sketching is super fun but how can I put in texture on my outdoor sketching papers I'm talking about urban sketching when you're outside and uh, you may be outside with a very small footprint in my case I bring I, I normally bring like two sketchbooks and then I always have a 2B pencil then I got my create a color pencil case it's an oil based pencil so it's got a hard firm tip which means that I don't need to sharpen it that often so I actually don't need to carry a sharpener with me because the, the tip is a bit like polychromous pencils you know the ones from Faber-Castell so it's like super firm very rarely snap on you if you're like a person that presses a lot so I like to carry this set because it's got everything that the hearts desire if you want to bring highlights you got the white you got the sepia tones and then you got some warm tones so in case you bump into like a portrait like you know you want to quickly sketch a person you can do that but you can also sketch buildings so it's very versatile this uh, color uh, scheme right here even though it seems a little bit monotone <laughs> then um, the watercolors that I bring with me when I am urban sketching or outdoor sketching is from Winsor & Newton I added in some pans I think I added in uh, let me think a crimson red maybe the white I'm not sure but definitely this black this is uh, simply just uh, to give myself a quick value because a lot of people will say like oh you can mix black out of these yeah but when you're on the go and it has to go fast then it's nice to have 
a very dark shade color to just grab, grab quickly so what I have pictured in my mind before I sit down and paint never comes out on the paper it's kind of funny in a way it's like you're sitting in front of a building and you know that if you had the time let's say you were home at your desk in your own environment and you had the reference photo in front of you then you could do a heck of a lot better job than when you're outside sketching so my experience is that I'm always a little bit disappointed <laughs> The reason is because, um, like this is a sketchbook. Uh, this is from a train station in Copenhagen and I named it the Silo Boys. <laughs> it's at a train station where this band of young people had to go down to the, the train. And then I noticed that all the band members carrying the light instrument, like the flute, <laughs> they uh, were like, in front of the troop, walking fast, making it on time, and then way, way back, where the poor, poor <laughs> cello boys dragging on their huge instrument that slowed them down, you know, because it was almost as big as themselves because it was like a junior teen band, uh, teenage band. <laughs> So I wanted to capture that because I thought it was super funny and to indicate that we are talking about kids and not like a grown man, I tried to uh, draw a woman with her daughter next to it so you size-wise can compare that these are like almost the same age. But look how uh, lack of detail, how quickly it's done. It looks like uh, it's a very sh a sloppy job because uh, it's wet and you don't have the time to wait for it to dry up. I cannot go in with the background colors close to the drawn figure, you know. <laughs> so you have to um, work fast and uh, skip some rules on the go. And most of my outdoor sketches is wonky. And uh, most, most of all, I like to just capture a face in the crowd. <clears throat> and then uh, now comes the other thing. I'm a super shy sketcher, right? I don't like that people know that I'm painting them. So often I sit with my sunglasses on so that the dude won't notice that I'm actually sitting eyeballing them and staring them. <laughs> so when I take off my eyeglasses and uh, my sunglasses, uh, the while well, because I'm mixing with the sunglasses on, I get. A, a surprise in the values because it's always different than when I from what I think I'm putting down so that's the fun part for instance a dude like that who would dare sit and stare him down in a train <laughs> uh, so that's why I try to uh, capture uh, while uh, you know not showing that I am uh, sketching them as you can see here, I'm at a blues bar called Mojo in Copenhagen, and there is this uh, guitar blues singer on the stage. And I'm getting, once again, shy and uncomfortable because I'm sitting in a bar. So flinging out a sketchbook, starting to draw in the middle of a bar is like, uh, you know. <laughs> I think uh, I need to be brave. Um, this is like how I feel when I'm outside sketching like shy and the <gasps> humans are coming and watching I better pack my stuff together and run so it's kind of fun to um, yeah just uh, what is it called when you're crossing over boundaries trying to be braver so but I love um, outdoor sketching. It's a fun addition to my um, notebooks. I got some examples. This is one of the examples where I'm standing and in my head I got a vision about how beautiful these very tall and slim trees were, but I can't really depict it when I try to draw it. And this is also on the spot where um, I was interested in the roof because it was was made out of straws, you know, the old school kind of roof. So, but I don't really get the texture of it. 
and I think it's because I need to be um, better at making my pencil marks before I go in with a glaze of color. So I have been uh, studying James Gurney for quite a while because he seems to get that, you know. He he is sketching in a way that is so awesome that he practically just need a wash of color to finish it off. And I uh, look at his work and I think about the French Grisaille, you know, where you are blocking in your values with a gray tone or a caput mortum or green so that your shades are already on your paper before you add the color. Because his marks and pencil striations in shadow areas are just so unique. And now we're talking about detail and stuff, right? This is like the ultimate, like this, <laughs> this is what I think I should aim for, like super detail, uh, a very uh, unique rendition. Look at the striation right here with, they have used the striation in the shadow areas and also starting the curve of the building with striation, pushed back uh, line work here and then light sketches of the background <laughs> and then even focusing on the sky by putting in these uh, marks here on the sky. This inspires me but I will never reach this level because I will not. First of all I don't bring a ruler with me when I'm outdoor sketching but I think it's okay to aim for the sky, you know. <laughs> I think it's okay to have this as a vision because then I will always push myself to calm down, try get it as straight as possible because somehow I can't get over that I really like it. I mean, I dislike when I come home with a super wonky line, but I also have to take in consideration that most of the time when you're outdoor sketching you're actually holding your book in your lap like you're sitting in a train station <laughs> and you're like you know holding it close you've got some art supplies dangling on your lap you know it's a bumpy train ride or something so uh, the charm about uh, the bumpy lines and everything can be enhanced by doing some splatters next to it kind of showing that it's like a a sketch like a, a throw up on the paper <laughs> something done in a hurry the way that you just uh, put in one color here and then change direction uh, you know look look how messy the the colors are, are just kind of plucked in <laughs> that's the charm right but um yeah I want to show some of my outdoor sketching I actually followed an urban sketching group where you could uh, post your sketches by using the hashtag sketch with Lando and then you could view a lot of people's outdoor sketching and uh, I, I noticed that I like to post the ones that I have colored in and then I'm thinking I'm moving away from outdoor urban sketching because this is like a sitting I spent a lot of time on this. I mean, it was actually an outdoor painting and not like an urban sketching. And then I took another example of a real true urban sketching where I'm up on third floor looking down at the building and then when we leave I stand on the opposite pavement of the street and getting a, a view of it. And I'm really struggling with, you know, line work. <laughs> There are a lot of details on this one because, like I said, I, I really love this style here. So I'm trying to incorporate it in the freehand sketches. And I try to get the background city into the sketch also. But um, this is like line work. And then you need to, in my case, when you're, I come home, I want to put the color on it. So it kind of get, you know, a different texture when you look at it. 
So I have been uh, reading up on James Gurn's blog. He's got a blog. And uh, on his vlogs, he's got a ton of information, not just about outdoor sketching. I actually uh, printed out one of them. Uh, one of the things on his vlog was about the analyze of a figure in a quick sketch. M almost like croquis, you know, <laughs> where he used a grid that's just a cross on his uh, sketch line, on his sketchbook. And I can totally picture myself taking a page and then just drawing in the grid and then make sure that I place the person right where I want it so I avoid for instance if I had to make this one once more if I started up with the head too low that you would cut off the feet and the feet in this sketch is so likable because you got the shadow from the sun so it kind of tell the viewer that it's a sunset that these two are watching so imagine if I started the sketch too low you would cut off the feet and then the whole idea of telling people that this romantic couple is actually watching a sunset is uh, not possible so yeah anywho anywho I want to talk about James Burney and his um, color choices he had a rut when he was outdoor sketching. He sketched a lot, I'm telling you guys. And of course, like any artist, he's uh, because he's so active and productive, he kind of evolve constantly. So it's only natural to run into a calm period of time and feels like you're in an art rut. And then he tried to uh, spiff off his um, inspiration by telling himself that he could go out with a pencil and three colors. And he did. He took a cadmium orange, a sap green light, and a cobalt violet, and a pencil. And then he took himself out on this quest saying that whatever I sketch, I have to use these color combination. So no matter if it's a face, or a building, or even a seascape, I have to work like this. And that's kind of really likable, you know, limiting your supplies. So you're going with a super, super light footprint. It's so simple, you know, um, it's not complex. It's not like he had like, what is it, 16 colors? I don't even know. Let's count them. Uh, 14 colors that's a lot that's not limited palette right <laughs> this is freaking limited so I super love the approach he had he had to his art rod where he said three colors one pencil so let me um, work about how to create the uh, something that can uh, fit into my chapter about texture <laughs> texture in urban sketching because I think it's interesting and I do want to try out this um, this uh, theory so um, let me set up a grid so we can uh, start mixing these three colors and see what can we actually get from mixing these pans and to do so I'm gonna use skinny washi tape I love it I want to put down the skinny washi tapes so that um, it just looks pretty nice and uh, I really like uh, swatching and mixing like that so let me do that I think most of you have seen this like a hundred times before but let me just quickly go over what's happening here when you got a limited palette consisting of three pans you want to make a mixed chart to see what kind of colors can you get from these three pans um, when you mix them together <laughs> so picture that you have those three colors here so this column down here is going to be the orange mixed with the orange so it's always going to be <laughs> the mass tone of your um, of your pan but on the second uh, on the road, on the, when you go down on the second road, it's going to be interesting because then you see what happens if you mix the orange with the green, if you mix the orange with the purple. And then I know that 
when you do it the opposite way when it's time to mix the green you will still have the same green mixed with the orange but this time you're gonna have a ratio of more green and less orange so that's how you can actually um, see on a visual chart what colors you can get and how to read it is that when it's time to mix the green the green is going to be like the dominant ratio in the mix and when it's time to mix the purple is going to be the dominant mix so that's um that's actually how it works <laughs> i put it up with washi tapes because it's just fun to use washi tapes and then i take a palette and then i take maybe i should clean this palette that would be a good idea i take some puddles of each pan and now i'm starting with the orange one so what i do is first i color in on my chart what colors that i'm mixing and here you can go like really fancy and have a, a light color maybe i can try and illustrate it like here you could have like a saturated coat here and then you can dilute it out with just pu pure water so your mix chart also will show you how light you can dilute the the pan that you're in you could call it investigating right <laughs> So let's try that approach. And as you might be able to vis visualize is that the more pans you have to mix within each other, the bigger the chart, right? So these charts can be like really uh, super huge. So if it's the first time that you're doing a mixing chart, I will recommend start with three or four pans just to get the hang of it. Because then if you goof up on a huge chart, you won't be that disappointed and then give it up, you know, <laughs> because you have to do it one more time. This is not watercolor paper. It's exactly the kind of paper that I would go outdoor sketching with. I don't uh, really go out with watercolor paper. Um, it's mostly a sketchbook with hot press paper, like this uh, block right here. So that's why I picked this same paper quality that uh, I would go urban sketching with for this experiment. Okay, now we got them down. What I would do is that I will start investigating the orange. And I know that I need to mix it with two other colors. So I need two puddles. First, now when I got the pigment on the brush, instead of rinsing it out and wasting it, I will block in this one because orange mixed with orange it's gonna give you orange <laughs> so this is kind of a invalid block block you could say now I need to mix in the green and what I do is that I take the green and put it down here now I got like saturated green on my brush so I try to pick some of the orange and then I start swirling the green into the orange until I see a shift in color. I may need to put in more orange, if you know what I mean. Like if, if I'm not satisfied with the shift that I see. But here I can actually see that this is like um, a lighter version of the sap green with the orange inside so I'm thinking like if if green is the dominant color in this mix then mixed with a tint of orange would give me a lighter version 
of the sap green so I would definitely put that color right here so I will go in on this mix here and put in more orange to see what happens if I put in more orange and now I can see that I get like a muddy uh, almost ochre color but it sure is different from the puddle I got over here so that would definitely be if I make a mix where the orange is the dominant color and there is just a tint of the sap green I will end up with an ochre and then for fun before wiping off these pigments that I got on my um, palette I would go totally crazy with a very very <laughs> saturated green to see if something is changing nothing and in this case it's not noteworthy to put that in your chart but let's say that you you got a third tone like a third value you could definitely try and make a, a second coat in one of the quadrants where you think it belongs but in this case nothing like really exciting happened <laughs> so I'm just gonna leave that alone so now it's time to investigate the green pan of course on the first mix let's clean this up first yep <laughs> starting with two puddles and right now you might wonder why do I need two puddles the reason why I need two puddles is because watercolors has a shift from wet to dry so I cannot just eyeball the dried swatch up here I need to see the wet values up against each other when I'm doing these mixes and now I've got green on my brush and green mixed with green will become green so not to waste the pigment I might as well go, just go block in this right here now let's add some or some not orange some purple cobalt violet and like before I saturate my brush with cobalt violet and then I start mixing them together and then I noticed when I get a shift I can see that it's going to be like um, kind of a darker I actually have to go pretty dark but I would still say that violet is the dominant color so I would definitely put it here that when violet is the dominant color mixed with green you will get this right here like a burgundy and then because I'm anal I will mix in more of the violet see can I get that burgundy even darker and then I will trick it with the green adding in more green I can definitely tell already by now that I can get like a forest green looking like it got some black hues in it like a dark uh, olive let's put in more green can I get it even darker maybe and now where I think that I actually got a, a slightly different color <laughs> I'm gonna double coat it over here so I'm trying to get you could say the mass tone of the new mix in the beginning of my mix because that's an interesting color because you can um, you can really use that for foliage so you got like a light value for foliage and a darker value for foliage so I think it's interesting 
And because I got the wet puddle up here, I can see the contrast better. I can try adding in and see. So for me, this is like playtime when you're doing like a mess on your palette just to see what what's happening <laughs> when you swirl them together. And now for the last color. So as you can see, it looks like you have to do a lot of swatches because you are filling in this big grid right here. But the swatches actually goes pretty fast because you are able to fill out two or three spaces of the grid in one sitting. So I put down two colors of the purple. I got the purple on the brush, so why not? add it into this grid right here. Let's start putting in some orange. Here I'm really rinsing out that brush because I don't want to contaminate it from the beginning. So I'm putting down the orange and now I am working my way up to watch the purple. Here I can definitely see a color shift to a um, darker orange. So I'm actually going to put it in because it's darker than the okra that I mixed with the green. Orange, orange is still the dominant color. So now I'm working in more of the purple and I can see I can actually get something that reminds me of some sort of a burnt sienna. So I'm going in with the burnt sienna tone in the beginning of this chart swatch. Now I want to put more of the purple value into uh, the mix and see what uh, happens when you shade this mix with a, a glob of purple. Oh, you get a beautiful, simply just beautiful burgundy. definitely going to add that in because I like that color so I would be interested in be able to mix it once more. Let's put in more of the violet into that mix and then you can see you get a different sort of lilac. Also beautiful. So I'm gonna drop that lilac mix in the beginning of this swatch card here. Hoping that it will kind of show up when it dries. I don't care that if I get blooms or puddles in these swatch cards because if just one area dries up, like if this burnt sienna, like raw sienna area dries up with just a, a tiny fingerprint right there, I will know that, hey, that came from that mix, so I know what to do, right? Yeah. I'm putting in more of the purple. It's staying that lilac burgundy. Now I'm warming it up, getting a whole different tone. And in this case, I wouldn't mind to go, hmm, maybe I would place it here. So I know I'm painting outside the chart card, but it's still the same mix. It's a mix where the orange is mixed with the violet. But as you can see, the cobalt violet mixed with the cadmium orange can give you three steps. Like a raw sienna, like a really warm but a little bit muddy orange, but also a brown um, earth tone. So some of these mixes uh, are um, valuable <laughs> to have charted down because when you are on the go 
and you have to mix brown from the flying uh, of the seat of your pants. It's sometimes just nice to have a mix chart to glaze at, so you don't have to like invent the whole mixing wheel <laughs> while you're at, at the spot. And for the palette that you're carrying that got like only three pans, you should have enough uh, place to also carry this with you. So when you're not having to fold out a ton of art supplies. And I think that's like one of the errors that I'm for facing when I'm outdoor doing urban sketching. I bring too much stuff, man. I bring white jelly roll pens, ink pens, magical ink pens where the ink is going to uh, dilute out in violet, uh, sharpies, um, too many pens in my watercolor set. You know, just too many supplies, so instead of uh, just, why not keep it simple, so you only got this to work with. And because you are mixing with only three colors, these mixes are going to be harmonious. They are going to work together, so it will not look crazy to have them next to each other in a painting. So let's test out that theory. <laughs> Okay, now it's dried up and it's time to remove the tape. And it's also uh, like uh, the best, you know. <laughs> but before I remove the tape, I will actually try and go in and mix a black. And the way that I'm approaching it is that I'm simply just adding all the three colors together and see what is the darkest, dirtiest color that I can get by mixing these uh, three together. So I already know from the chart that the brown value comes by uh, putting in the orange. So I'm just going to twerk it back and forth with the orange and the purple until I get that dark brown and then it's right here somehow. And then go go in with the the green. I'm hoping to be able to mix a uh, neutral dark because now this got red reddish tones in it and the complementary co color to red is green. So in theory <laughs> I should be able to darken this one up even more by adding the green. Now it became too green so now I have to put in more of the purple and the orange and there's like no really recipe for this other than just keep going in with more and more and more until you think that you have reached the absolute darkest darkest uh, color that you can get I think we're there and I just finish off my swatch by making one long um, swatch with this dark where I try to dilute it out. And the reason why I dilute it out is because let's say that I was so lucky to have like an ultramarine in one of my pans, I will realize that it's granulating and separating its pigments. So when you dilute out and mix like that, new colors will emerge and give like an interesting, um, if you like it, <laughs> just an interesting effect. But in this case there's not like much interesting happening otherwise and you're just diluting out the the dark pigment in a very wet wash to see how it spreads out. Yeah. But time to um, take off the tape and this is like the fun 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 part where you can see this nice grit. But this is the palette that, according to James Gurney, <laughs> helped him out of an art slump once upon a time in his life. So um, it's going to be fun to see what I can do with his uh, limited palette. 
and how I can use it to add texture with color to a line, pencil line, urban sketch. Oh man, this is so f fulfilling. <laughs> you don't need the tape. You are able to paint squares right with a brush, but I just like the way they look so neat. So that's just like, you know, an extra fun additional <laughs> thing for me when I'm doing swatches. It's kind of give myself that last moment where I have to peel off the masking tape so it just um, looks nice. Yes. So the color chart is dried and uh, I'm working with watercolors. James Gurney liked to work with wash, but you know, it's still a water soluble medium. <laughs> I like what I'm looking at it. I like what I see and it kind of inspires me to try m mixing out the green for like a turquoise. Can you imagine putting in a teal instead of a green and then see what do you get? So yeah, it's very inspiring. I think that I should take <coughs> Um, an old outdoor sketch and see how could I improve this simple line work with more texture using my pencil to make more marks and how will it, will it look when I have to glaze it over with this limited palette. So um, taking the kind of paper that I would take with me out on a sketch urban sketching trip. It's called Skitsen paper. I like that it's a, a huge sheet because sometimes working in a small tiny book can be like a little bit clumsy. You know? <laughs> so, but the, the, the pro about this paper is that it's, inexpen it, it's inexpensive. It is, uh, you know, you can just uh, get it everywhere. And I like the way that the watercolors land on it if if you know because I know it's not going to be like a masterpiece you know so it's going to be like something quick something easy uh, so I don't even mind that the watercolors when they dry up get this kind of funky cartoonish uh, look to it hmm this is by the way CC creation uh, she's got a channel where she's showing these things. So in, in case you th you think that, oh, this was so beautiful, <laughs> go check out CC. Let me write down her name now when I just sporadically bumped into her. But I basically just wanted to show so you don't get disappointed using a, a sketch pad like this. It will not be watercolor paper. It will <laughs> be these very flat textures, like um, it's got this very special look to it. So let me just grab a sheet from this uh, paper and then start sketching in um, a previous sketch. And I'm going to approach it like I'm standing on the spot not having rulers, not having all the time in the world because I'm standing on a pedestrian street kind of shy. <laughs> I don't I want to take like real good time doing it. I'm going to put down this uh, swatch card because my camera totally freaks out with the only white on my uh, surface. Maybe I can do like this so the camera will love it a bit more. <coughs> Okay, <laughs> going fast. I'm seeing a building. When I watch the building, I think that this front side of the building could be the most interesting because uh, I like visualizing that up close. If I sketch the front side, then I could make some pretty cool dark uh, shaded areas where the light is. Because if the light comes from up here, it will cast a shadow from the balcony and from the the roof part here. And then we have this um, marquise from a bakery that could be fun to color in in stripes. That would be a fun eye candy thing. So 
definitely <laughs> I'm going for that quick sketch just to catch in the essence of the building and I don't even mind if I'm getting off the paper because this is actually how I would do it on the spot simply just get the essence of it can you see how fast this goes and then there is this uh, Kringle, Kring, pretzel, it's called a pretzel. Oh man, a name that I knew. <laughs> and look how I am taking my time to get the detail with the pretzel because that's the only thing indicating that it's a bakery. So uh, I wouldn't mind slowing down to get that detail in. And then we have like um, some sort of line work up here. And if I want a little bit on the back, in this case, I don't think that I will because it will destroy my sketch if I like here try to make the side of the building because it's just going to be roof. It's going to be like a dead area. So instead of giving myself like a dead area here, I'm simply just going to imagine some f kind of foliage on the behind so this is like front view and that's it <laughs> that's it then I would leave so already now I can see that I kind of got a more living sketch a more like um, better view because I cut off the dead spots so I man manipulated with giving myself an opportunity to put in some green um, values here with the foliage and I got what I wanted the bakery shop I have not decided on any pavement or anything so this could actually end off like a classic watercolor drawing where it just is a lot of splatter or puddles you know just like disappear <laughs> I have a slanted interesting line here going just off with no really direction so it's gonna be an eye catcher you know like what what uh, what's this you know <laughs> so sometimes putting in all the lines is uh, not um, necessary of course there are windows if I want to put in windows um, I think I would prefer not to because uh, it will clutter down the elements. I mean, it, I like this airy approach. So now, let's say that I came home. I came home and this is what I got on my paper. <coughs> I got the time. So now I can really sit in and go more detailed with my pencil marks. And this is where I think that I got a lot to learn from James Gurney, the way that he's using uh, striations, like uh, adding in some sort of uh, pen work before he put in colors. And this is the kind of work that I would love if I was able to do on the fly when I'm out there. Oh shoot, now we're getting visitors company. Yeah, so when I get off that pavement and in a car, or let's just keep the fantasy real. There happens to be a cafe across the road <laughs> and I'm sitting in that cafe right now let's just picture that putting in the lines I got the building in front of me and I am trying to work in with the pencil stroke some marks to uh, help me to put in some bricks some texture on the building something that shows that it's not just a white white building and then I'm working on some 
cast iron uh, thingy on the balcony and I am um, defining the um, the roof a little bit more and because I got the color chart in front of me it's pretty easy going in with the foliage because I know that the orange and the green give this light green and then um, a little bit of violet to that green gives like a a hookah's olive green and then adding more orange to that mix you end up with the bark brown so voila can you see how fast it was when you got the color chart to just go in and make those colors from the get-go because you kind of know how to get them and uh, I'm working with the cobalt violet as a shadow tone and I really like that and if I had had all the colors in my palette, I would definitely have grabbed an ultramarine and a burnt sienna and started out with some sort of a grayish shadow tone. So just the fact that the shadow tones is now completely in violet is a huge change, game changer. And the, the complementary color to the cobalt violet must be the orange in this case. So also like an unusual choice for me. <laughs> But uh, all in all, I think that these colors gave a very different, likable sketch compared to what I would have picked if I had my uh, travel 14 pan Windsor Newson watercolor set with me in this um, imaginary cafe session right here. Yeah, so this is the finished piece as I would leave it in a urban sketching book, you know. <laughs> I kind of totally love the free pan limit palette, but I have to admit that I was kind of missing the blue for the sky in the end, you know. And then I thought, what happened if I added in like a turquoise blue to the existing free colors? And then the, I made um, some swatches just uh, trying it out. And look, I get generic colors. I got the blue for the sky, almost the viridian for the green, a uh, very nice like hookers green, and a, a dark blue. So can I can just imagine that if I had that choice in my palette, since I'm a creature of habit, I would totally grab it and then suddenly this tree here would have much darker green. There would be like a blue sky. I would try using the blue with the brownish color to mix a gray for my shadow areas. So suddenly I would take the <laughs> basic choices that I seem to take with uh, my regular stash, right? And uh, I think what may put you in a art rut is that you get that creature of habit you pick the same favorite green um, the same favorite composition with a blue sky you know so what James Gurney is doing by limiting to these three colors is that he's giving himself the opportunity to not fall into the old pattern with the viridian colors for the foliage and in case he want to put in a sky, it has to be like a very uh, stormy sky with some hint of purple, looming green, or just an ochre sky, you know. So um, I kind of like uh, this page. So, <laughs> But um, I worked a little bit with texture with the pencil with marking before I added in my uh, color glaze. And the finished look, I really like that mix there is of the sketch lines and the foliage. It looks in the spirit of urban sketching. Like something fast done on the go, capturing the front of a building. And I didn't even care that I'm switching up the original true look because this is like the true sketch of the building. So I, I would actually rather have this colored one with the pencil texture instead of just line work so yeah hmm. thanks for watching
I'll uh, catch you guys later <laughs> when I work more in this uh, crazy journal of mine. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.